I'm Jethro Jones from Transformative Principle, a proud member of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to right now. The opinions expressed are those of the individual hosts. Make sure you check out the other great podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. And get ready because the learning begins in three, two, one. to episode 85 of the Google Teacher Tribe podcast, your source for the latest Google for Education news, tips, tricks, and ideas you can use in class tomorrow. I'm Matt Miller from Ditch That Textbook. And I'm Casey Bell from Shake Up Learning. And in today's episode, we are going to dive into accessibility tools that either are built into Google or work with Google tools. You know, the ability to use our favorite Googly things to reach all learners in our classroom. So we're going to share some resources. In fact, we've got more resources in these show notes than we will be able to cover today. So we have a ton of information to help you and your students. And of course, we've got a few Google news and updates and some feedback from our listeners. So you ready to get this started, Matt? Yeah, let's do it. Let's kick this episode off with some Google news and updates. And in this first one, we're going to be talking about Google Earth and something that has a very dear place in my heart, U.S. National Parks. I know the Miller family, we just, uh, within the last year, got to go to uh, the Grand Canyon for the first time. And since then and before then, I've totally, totally been in love with national parks and state parks. And guess what? Now we can use Google Earth to tour 31 different parks around the United States. So they've got these guided tours that you can go on through Google Earth where you can see all of the different important parts of so many of these national parks. So if one of these national parks or really anything in this whole collection has anything to do with what you're teaching, or if you want to center a lesson around one of them, now it's almost like an on-demand virtual field trip where you can take your students to places like Acadia National Park. You can go to the Grand Canyon. You can go to Denali or the Everglades National Park, the Grand Tetons. I mean, I can kind of go on and on and on with this. And of course, it does take you right down on the ground, almost as if you were there with um, the the type of street view technology that that we've come to know and love through Google Maps and Google Earth. So Again, one of those really, really nice features, and this really does have a lot of the national parks that I want to hit on my bucket list one of these days. So this is a really rich, really nice resource. So Matt, you're going to use this as your travel guide. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I'm going to go scope things out before I actually go. Absolutely. There you go. Well, I'm going to switch gears and jump into a G Suite update that I think everybody's going to be excited about. So I feel like we've had a little bit of a moving target the last few years when it comes to using docs, sheets, and slides in offline mode. They keep kind of changing things up. So we've got some updates that are going to allow us to work anywhere with docs, sheets, slides, in offline mode. So if you have bad internet or you're traveling or you know you're just going to be offline for whatever reason, this is a lifesaver. So I do this all the time. And especially when I'm presenting, I'm so happy when the internet goes down and I still have a presentation because mm. I've got it saved offline. Mm-hmm. So um, huge tip here. When you go into Drive, what you're going to be able to see is when you right click on your file, you'll be able to use a little toggle button to have it available offline. That's similar to how it has been working, at least on my mobile device as well. But this is very, very nice. Of course, it's going to store it locally and it's going to depend on you having space on your local hard drive for these types of documents. But um, this is rolling out a little bit slowly here. So some of you won't see this till maybe the end of May, but it will be nice, especially if you've got some summer travels coming up and you're planning on 
working who's planning on working over the summer i don't know i'll be working so <laughs> maybe this will come in handy as you are um you know typing your journal in google docs your travel journal that's what you're doing you're not working you're doing fun stuff so um there are uh, of course links back to these updates with some additional information about the rollout and everything else and information for administrators if you are an admin over your domain for your school there's some setup involved for that so that's the other piece. If you're not seeing it, it's past time to roll out could also have to do with your school. So be sure that you have some communication going about that. So great feature coming our way. That is a great feature. I'm looking forward to that. All right. So the next one, this one has to do with those of you that use Dropbox. So if you've got a Dropbox account, if maybe you started using that before you had Google Drive, or if you've got, you know, for whatever reason, uh, we have good news for you that there is a beta that Dropbox, like a beta program, like a test it out type of program that's going to allow Dropbox users to work with docs, sheets, and slides. Ready for this? directly in Dropbox. So this is like a nice integration where you don't have to, for instance, save your Google Slides file as a PowerPoint file and then upload it into Dropbox. It's not going to be clunky. It's going to be all nice and integrated. So it says that you can start a shared doc sheets or slides file right from Dropbox.com or from the apps on Windows or Mac and then have it stored in Dropbox. And then when you open those files, you'll be taken straight to the your normal Google editors just within Dropbox. So these are going to work very nicely together so that you don't have to do any of those clunky like download, upload type of type of motion. So um, if you're using Dropbox and you are a big fan of doc sheets and slides, this update is for you. I love it. So I know a lot of people who are diehard Dropbox fans, so I'm sure they will be happy to hear about that. Um, I'm I'm not a diehard user. I use it when I have to <laughs> because some people still share things with me through Dropbox. So I do still have an account, but it's nice to know that we can sort of merge those two worlds. As we like to say, Google does play well with others. So it's good to see that that playground is happening, right, Matt? Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> That's right. On the playground again. <laughs> On oh, the playground. We can't oh, get off the playground. No, no. Okay, so I'm going to talk about Google Sites. And this is going to harken back to episode 83 when we talked to Joe Marquez about duplicating sites, setting up templates, and being able to do some different things. So very timely that we also got this update or announced on April 19th that you're going to have the ability to duplicate larger sites in, inside Google Sites. I didn't realize this was actually an issue, but apparently when you would try to duplicate a site that had quite a bit of content, you could run into some issues. So what they are going to allow you to do now is you're still going to be able to make that copy. You're going to go to your more menu, go to duplicate site and ha have those options there and to even share it with the same people if you want. But they base this off of user feedback. So they're listening to you. And that's one of the things that I also love about Google is they're not out there willy nilly making their, their own choices, but they're actually trying to improve the products based on what people are asking for. And so they're improving that site copy to make make it easier to copy those larger sites. And they do have some information in the blog post about those supported sizes. So if you've run into this issue, you can find out more specifically about that. But this is going to help you more efficiently copy those sites. So if you're creating maybe a site for a unit that you reuse next year, you know, I'm just thinking of all the different ways because I duplicate sites all the time and it definitely comes in handy, but it also allows you to back up your work. So, you know, you could duplicate it to sort of preserve a copy as well that you could come back to or iterate on something that you've done previously and to create those, you know, quote unquote templates that we want to use and reuse based on what we learned from the fabulous show Marquez. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So if any of that is interesting to you and you want some more details, you can head right over to our show notes at googleteachertribe.com slash 85. Hey, Tribe, let's talk about accessibility and more specifically how 
the Google tools that we already use have accessibility features built into them that can help not only those struggling learners in our classrooms, but really they can help all learners. So, you know, evening the playing field for for some, but also, you know, some of these features are things that just make life easier. They help us. They make us more productive. And there's some really great ideas that we discovered as we were planning this episode. And one of those, which I did not know it existed until just a few minutes ago when I was looking, is um, Google's full accessibility guide and list of all of their accessibility features. So those are in our show notes, but um, you can go to google.com slash accessibility and it's this gigantic list of, oh, sorry, that's not the gigantic list. That's that's the home with products and features. So you can jump to products and features and then you see the huge list. And so they've got all kinds of things that I know I didn't know existed. So whether you're looking for something app specific or you're looking for something specific to help um, a, a certain student who maybe has low vision or need some, you know, speech to text or text to speech, those types of things you're going to find here. And it's broken down by app. So you can see the Chrome browser, Chrome OS, Classroom, Gmail, Calendar, Docs, tons of things. We've taken some of the best features that we feel like are going to impact the most of you and put those in our show notes as well. But I wanted to be sure and mention that 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 is there as well as a G Suite user guide to accessibility. And this is for all G Suite users, not just education. So found it very useful. And especially if you're working um, to support teachers and to support students with any of these features, it's really great to have this bookmarked and reference this in your trainings if you're helping teachers and being able to do all of those things together. And another link that we mentioned back a few episodes ago is back to a blog post from the Keyword blog, where they talk about adapting to the needs of learners, educators, and schools with Chromebooks. So Chromebooks specifically do a lot of really cool things for accessibility. And in a lot of these, like I said, I'm just learning about it's it's all built in to Chrome. So you can find a full list of those as well as like Chrome extensions, those third party tools that are going to offer a lot of things to help us meet the needs of the learners in our classrooms. Yeah, and that's that's really the the big goal here is to you know to to make it so that no one has barriers to learning. And one of the things that I love about all of these accessibility features is that they're all baked right into so many of these Google products. And the nice thing about all of these accessibility features is it does help us to meet the universal design for learning guidelines. If you haven't heard of UDL before, you know, basically, you know, the, the website says that its goal is to improve and optimize teaching and learning for all people based on scientific insights into how humans learn. And isn't that really how we want to teach is the way that humans learn because we are teaching humans, you know? Um, and so this, of course, doesn't just mean special needs and, um, you know, trying to take care of students who who are dealing with those. This is for everybody. And this is for opening up opportunities for kids to, to learn and, and the ways that best suit them. And so there's so many of these things available for all of us. And, um, you know, these these really can have a big impact on the way that we teach and the way that we learn. And so um, let's let's go ahead and start diving into some of the features, some of the things that that we really love. Um, I'm going to start out with surprise, surprise, the one that <laughs> Casey and I talk about so much, which is Google Slides. And you know, Google Slides does have a ton of really good accessibility features. One of the ones that we've talked about an awful lot on the podcast before is how you can now use the um, live closed captions. Whenever you bring up Google Slides and you start a slide presentation, you can turn on those closed captions with the little button down in the toolbar in your presentation mode. And by using that little button, it'll access the microphone on your device. And as you're talking, it will transcribe your words directly onto the screen so that others are able to see it. So just simply that in and of itself is is a really, really good way to go. And then within Google Slides, of course, we have an entire um, accessibility settings 
menu. So it gives you the option to turn on a screen reader so that, you know, if you, if you have issues with being able to see text on the screen and all that's, that's available. There's even Braille support within that. Um, you can turn on your screen magnifier. And so being able to, to see things bigger so that, you know, again, so that everybody's able to, to work on these tools. So these are just a couple of the things related to slides that really do make for a more accessible tool that, that really everybody can use. And, you know, we we hit on this a few weeks back when the update was added. But if you haven't opened up slides or docs or sheets or any of your usual G Suite tools, when you now go to tools, you can see accessibility settings in your menu there. So you're going to be able to find those more quickly than we could before. So I like the fact that they're now embedding this into each application so that it becomes more apparent that these tools are accessible or how you can bring in some of those third-party tools and the screen readers and those other types of, of assistive learning types of technology. I want to talk about one of my favorite accessibility settings, which is in Docs, and that's voice typing. And voice typing is such a powerful tool. You know, it is speech to text, and almost all of us talk faster than we type. Um, I don't know. Somebody might have to do a speed test on me, but um, <laughs> I definitely <laughs> feel like, I, I mean, I, I I can type decent, but no, I, I can talk like 90 to nothing. So <laughs> it's pretty hard to compete with that. In fact, I have to slow myself down when I get really excited, like I do on the podcast. So, but I, I did a blog post actually way back called seven reasons to try voice typing in Google Docs. And so it's not just about that speech to text as a, an accessibility as is that modification that some students need who struggle with the keyboard and things like that. But there's a lot of ways that this can be useful for all learners. So, you know, first of all, it's a time saver, right? As I said, most of us talk faster than we type. And if you didn't realize, you can actually dictate the formatting into Docs. And it's way better than Siri. I'm just saying, y'all, Siri does not speak East Texan. So <laughs> you have to get that that punctuation in there. You can say period, new paragraph, bold, italics. You can put it all in there and it understands you. It's very, very handy. So it's a time saver for you. It's a time saver for your students. And as a former writing teacher, oh my goodness, how much time it would take sometimes for students to type their papers. So a, a great, great tool. Of course, that's this is dictation. So this is great for notes, for meetings, to-do lists, starter sentences, thesis statements, vocabulary, spelling lists, math word problems, anything you can think of. And there's so many other ways that we can use it because you can actually use it to correct your mistakes while you're typing. So you can just go back and move your cursor and have it, you know, speak it into it again to make those those changes and revisions that we need to make. The other thing is, those of you who teach the littles, the itty bitties, that don't know how to read yet, they don't know how to write yet, but they can talk. They can form sentences. And so I think it's a great support for those itty bitties who are just learning to put these things together. And what a great way to make use of that and to help anyone who's who's even struggling with it at any age. So the support feature is also great for English language learners and Matt's favorite foreign language yes. because you can dictate in other languages. Yes, you can. Yeah. Yeah. So you can hit that microphone and you can actually change that language, which is great. I don't think Tex-Mex is available yet, but I'll keep <laughs> looking. <laughs> so <laughs> it's about as good as my Spanish gets, y'all. The, um, the other thing that I love is that this feature is also available in the mobile app for docs. So, you know, that you can use it on your iPads, you can use it on your Android devices, and also, you know, just get everything going. Now, the other thing is that some people are gonna be like, but Casey, I can't handle the chaos of everybody talking into their devices <laughs> at once. So that's one of those things I'm like, you kind of have to get used to that. It's just something that's going to happen. We have to get used to talking to our stuff. And I'll tell you that if you divide up the room pretty well, Google's actually pretty good at just 
tuning into the voice that's speaking directly into the device. So I think um, these are some of my favorite ways to use voice typing. And of course, it's also available in speaker notes and slides. Yeah. So you can put it there, just copy and paste it into the slide if you need to. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. This is this is one of my favorites too. Um, you mentioned the foreign language that for, for my fellow foreign language teachers, it's a good way to practice your pronunciation or your student's pronunciation. Because if they are butchering a word so much that it can't be understood by voice typing and it doesn't show up quite right, then they know that they need to work on their pronunciation a little bit. That's one way. See, I'm, I kind of geek out about this feature too, about the voice typing. Um, there's another place that I use this for that didn't make your list case. You know what that is? What? Gmail. So ah. I have seen there are some add-ons to Gmail that will do voice to text for your email, but I don't like them as much as I like the voice typing in Docs. You know what I'll do is I'll just type in docs.new into my Chrome browser because, you know, when you type in docs.new, it pops open a brand new Google Doc. And I will open up the voice typing and I'll just say what it is that I want to put into my email reply, copy and paste it over into the, um, into the email. So that's yet another way, another way you can use it, right? Yeah, exactly. Now there was one last thing that I wanted to mention related to accessibility and that has to do with zooming. You know, sometimes it's these little things that we kind of take for granted that we don't think about that much that have a big impact on certain students. And just the simple fact that if you run something in your web browser, you know, of course, Casey and I are partial to Google Chrome. If you run a website within Google Chrome, you have the ability to do the web page zoom. So whatever the, you know, whatever the site is, whatever the um, tool is that you're using within your browser, if you just do that control plus and control minus or on a Mac, of course, it's command plus command minus, you know, just little things like that. Sometimes you don't think of that as being um, such a crucial feature, but to, to some students, um, that, that really makes all the difference. Um, there are all, there's also another neat trick that is good for accessibility, but it's also kind of a cool thing to do, especially if you um, present your Chromebook onto a projector screen, and that is the magnify your screen keyboard shortcut or... Um, you know, just, just being able to use the magnify your screen feature. And so here's how that works. So to set that up so that it will work, you'll want to go into your settings in your Chromebook and click on advanced down at the bottom and go to manage accessibility features. And under display, you're going to be able to turn on the docked magnifier. And so what that magnifier will let you do is it'll let you do what I kind of like to call a pop zoom, you know, like how it pops into to a certain spot on your screen. And the easiest way that I've found to do that is to use the keyboard shortcut, which is control alt. And then you do a two finger scroll on your touchpad going up. So that's control alt. And then you scroll up with two fingers. And then if you want to decrease that magnification, if you want to bring it back out, you go control alt two fingers down. And what that does is it kind of mimics the cool zooming feature that you've got on MacBooks. I know, for instance, you know, one of my favorite things that I can do on my MacBook is hold in the control button and then zoom up and zoom down with my two fingers going up and down on my touchpad. And I use that whenever I present in front of uh, teachers to be able to zoom in on certain things. And inevitably, somebody will say, hey, how did you do that? And I have to say, sadly, that particular feature is just a MacBook feature unless you're using a Chromebook and then it's got sort of a version of that. So again, that's in settings, advanced, and then it's under the accessibility section. You go to display and it's the thing called the docked magnifier. And when that's turned on, you can use that cool keyboard shortcut, control alt, and then scroll up with two fingers, scroll down with two fingers, and it will let you do that, that zoom feature. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. And you know, We've shared other tips along the way. We filled these show notes with a ton of extra tips, even though we don't have time to talk about all of them today. Um, but more specifically, if you want some of these resources, don't forget to go to the show notes at googleteachertribe.com slash 85. There's a letter in your mailbox. Hey, you know what? This is all your mail. 
Hey, maybe I'll give you a call sometime. You've got mail. All right, it is mailbag time. So we're going to start this one off with a question from Alex Tugas from Annapolis, Maryland, and he's got a question about Google Forms. Take it away, Alex. Hi, Matt and Casey. This is Alex Tugas from Annapolis, Maryland. I'm not sure if my last message came through, so I want to try again. But anyway, I had this issue with Google Forms in which in quiz mode, it does not allow you to break the quiz up in sections or save your work as you go um, like it does in survey mode for forms. It's too bad because if you could make a quiz more like a survey, that would alleviate the problem, but that doesn't because you can't grade them that way. So I was wondering if there's a workaround. This is really in an attempt to use a Google form for a summative assessment. It's fine with formative assessments because you don't have that many questions. But say you're given 50 multiple choice, you don't want them all in one page uh, without the ability to save as you go. So if you don't mind throwing it out to the tribe or answering it, if you have a fix, that would be great. Thank you. Ah, this is such a great question. And this is a feature that I'd love Google to be able to incorporate into the quizzes feature of Google Forms because, you know, you create one of those enormous Google Forms with a whole bunch of questions on it. And if a student gets maybe halfway, two thirds, three quarters of the way through and something weird happens, they end up losing all of that progress. And it's kind of nice to break it up into different pages. So I'm totally with Alex on this one. As far as a workaround goes, This is the best thing I could come up with. And when Casey and I were talking about this earlier, I called this an inelegant workaround. So this is, this is the best, the best idea I have, but I'm not suggesting this is amazing. Uh, I could see, let's say that you have a 40 question test and you want to break it into four equal 10 question parts. Instead of doing the sections, which would be so much easier. What I could see you doing is creating four separate forms, 10 questions each. And then once a student finishes the first form in the confirmation message, you know how you can edit the confirmation message whenever it confirms that you have submitted it in the confirmation message, you could say part one is complete. Click here to go to part two. And so then you would just you would just paste in the link to that second set of questions, that second Google form. Then they take that second Google form, submit, and then have the link there to the third one, do the same thing to the fourth one. So then that way you've got four Google forms with 10 questions each. Now that's going to create a little more seamless experience for your student so that all of that progress isn't lost. The problem is that it does take a little bit more setup time for the teacher and the grading process is a little bit more complicated. That's the best that I could come up with. I am hoping, I am counting on the tribe to maybe have something a little more elegant than what I've got. So if you've got something, we would love to hear about it. So please do go to googleteachertribe.com and leave us a voice message, uh, leave us a message in text. Uh, However you want to do it, we would love to hear your suggestions to Alex on this. Yeah, this is a question that I get all the time and and there's not really a good way to fix it. But, you know, so often kids are working at different speeds. So some kids will finish and some kids will finish halfway and some kids may only get a fourth of the way through. So it definitely becomes a struggle and trying to get them back to where they need to be the next day, even with a link can be difficult. So um, if anybody has ideas, I am very interested to hear that. I have a question here from Camille Jorgensen in Rangeley, Colorado. And Camille has a, another really great question. She says, is it possible to go into calendar, search for and extract particular events? I'm using my calendar to record my times driving a route for the school. Is it possible to go into calendar, find all of that particular event, and then export them into a different document? Okay, that is a very advanced question and very smart. I mean, that would be super handy to be able to do that. So my first thought when I hear that, that's not something that's built into calendar. However, it is possible, Camille. So You can export from calendar, but really all they let you export is that calendar file type, that ICS file. So if you're like taking your your events and importing from Outlook into Google Calendar or vice versa, 
but I did find a pretty neat, neat Google sheet that has a script that I think may do what you want. But here's my first advice. Before you look at this link that I'm going to give you in the show notes, I want you to make all of those events on a separate calendar in Google Calendar so that when you export, you're just going to be able to select that one calendar and export everything from there. Um, I, that will also just help you be able to see things a little bit differently if you're not already doing that. So um, that's that's one of the best things I love about Google Calendar is being able to set up multiple calendars. So if you don't have one specifically for that driving that you're doing, go do that and add those events there. And then take a look at um, the blog post that I gave you. They have a template. So you can go make a copy of this Google Sheet and then you're going to open and you're going to go into the script editor and it's got very specific directions. It looks really complicated. Don't let the script scare you. All you got to do is type in some information in into that editor and let it connect to your Google Calendar and bring those pieces in. So I hope this is useful. I know a lot of people have done similar types of things. So this is not the end all be all. This is just a blog post that I happen to find and not from anybody that I know in particular. So if anybody has anything better, of course, please share that. But I think we all kind of get into some situations where we want to track things that we're doing on our calendar because that's very useful information, especially for reporting and things like that. So great question. And thanks for sharing that, Camely. I should say. I hope I'm saying that right. <laughs> and if anybody else has questions, tips, shout outs, anything that you want to share with the tribe, please go to googleteachertribe.com slash feedback and let us hear from you. Let's see what's been happening on the blogs. So I have a new blog post and podcast episode to share with you. It's called 60 Tools to Inspire Students with Chromebooks. And it was inspired, actually, by um, some information I found from Google. And I just thought it was a great list of tools. It really hits the spectrum on everything from creation, assessment, STEAM, all kinds of tools. So if you really want to make the most of those Chromebooks in your classroom, um, you can go check that out at shakeuplearning.com. Yeah, that looks like a fantastic post. Definitely check that one out if you've got Chromebooks in your schools. If your students have access to those, this will be great. I've also got a new post that you might want to check out called 60 Tips to Spark Creative Lesson Ideas. So I know I've heard so many teachers talk about how they don't feel creative, they don't feel innovative, and they think, where in the world do these teachers come up with these cool ideas? And I have found that the worst place to find creative lesson ideas is when you're sitting at your desk with your blank lesson plan book staring you in the face and you're trying to be creative on command. It's like it just, it just doesn't seem to happen. So I brainstormed a list of a whole bunch of different things that we can do Ideally, not in the moment when we have to come up with, you know, conjure up those those creative lesson ideas right away, but some things that can get us in the habit of of thinking of them, not necessarily in the moment when we need them. And so there's there's all of these different ideas. If you check out the list, I'm sure there'll be a few of them that will probably work for you. And you can get the links to both of those on our show notes at googleteachertribe.com slash 85. All right, Tribe, we are done with yet another episode of the Google Teacher Tribe. So you've got some accessibility tools to go check out. We will be super, super curious to hear if you try any of these and have some success. If there are any of these in particular that are a win for you and your students, please do let us know about that out on the Google Teacher Tribe Twitter hashtag, which is GT Tribe. Yes, and we also love reading your reviews and hearing anything that you want to share with us. So um, we would love it if you would click that subscribe button and leave us a review in iTunes. That helps other teachers find the tribe and learn all of the things, not only from Matt and I, but all of the things that the tribe shares. And that's the power of us all working together. So thank you all for listening. And we hope to catch you on the next episode. Yes, we will see you on the next episode of the Google Teacher Tribe podcast. Bye, y'all.
Thanks for listening to the Google Teacher Tribe podcast. Keep up with every new episode by subscribing on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher, and by visiting googleteachertribe.com. Get in on the conversation on Twitter by using the hashtag GTTribe. Until next time, keep harnessing the G Suite power, and may the Googles be with you.